God's food laws. And you might think, well, that's going to take about five minutes because we know what it says. We know what unclean and clean meats are. So what else is there to say? And irregardless of my title, I, want to, I, want to, I do want to talk about that a little bit today. And I want to talk about it from, specifically, we'll talk about you know, clean and unclean meats and the requirement that we have to, to follow those, the, those laws of God. But it's much deeper than that. And we're going to talk a little bit today about some of the meaning that, we, that might get lost on us. Many of us, many people in God's church, say, I'm not eating that because God says not to. It's very clear. There's a nice list there. And there are others who have, some of them have been around or are, have questioned that over the years and saying, is it really that big a deal? Maybe it's just a recommendation. You know, if you eat this, you're going to get sick. Well, it's, we're going to see that it's, it's more than that, and I want to, I want to go into that. But specifically, as we talk about God's foods laws, we want to, I want to start by just making the statement that all of God's laws were given for good reason. Okay, if we, we won't go through them all, <laughs> but we have to consider that God's laws, they teach us his standards, right? They teach us how to distinguish right from wrong, how to distinguish good from evil, how to distinguish what's beneficial for us and what's harmful. And most importantly, I think, they teach us to distinguish the holy. God's laws teach us to distinguish the holy and that which God sets apart, okay, from the common and the ordinary. And that's important to remember as we, as we go through this. God's laws divine, define the way that we too are to be holy, right? to be set apart for God's purposes. And as we apply these, these laws in our lives, they encourage us not just to, to do it because God says to, but they encourage us to start thinking differently. The goal is that we begin to think like God. You see, if we start thinking like God and we start following these laws, they alter our perceptions. You know, for example, keeping the Sabbath day, we're here today, right? Not just because God says to. The deeper implication for us is that they ch it changes the way we think about and use our time. Even the, the concept of, of tithing, his law regarding tithing concerns or concerning portions of our income, alter our perception of, of and use of our physical resources. You see, in the same way, God's law concerning meats that are appropriate or inappropriate for human consumption, as we know, are referred to as clean and unclean meats in the scriptures, change our re perspective regarding what we eat. God expects his church to teach his people to distinguish, distinguish between what is biblically right and what is wrong. Ezekiel 44, if you want to turn there, we'll start talking about this and, and the deeper meaning of God's laws, not just the food laws. But Ezekiel chapter 44, we'll simply read verse 23. And again, it's talking about, as it talks about, they shall teach my people. It's talking about uh, spiritual leaders, right? They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. As I mentioned earlier, our, our creator has given very specific written regulations regarding what we can eat and what we can't. And for most of us, or many of us, that's enough. He says, I'm not doing it. Don't do it. I'm not doing it. But he gives us all of these things, his commandments, his laws, his statutes, his, his, his uh, judgments for a purpose. If we think specifically in regards to avoiding unclean meat, God is seeking much more than just obedience. When we first come into church, when we first learn the truth, that's where we start. It's just obedience. We do it because God says that. But God wants us to change the way we think 
He wants to fundamentally change the way that we assess situations, the way we evaluate them, then act upon things. Right? He wants us, again, to distinguish good from evil, what is helpful from what is harmful. He wants us to distinguish from what is holy, holy from what is unholy, from what is set apart from what is common. Again, I mentioned the Sabbath earlier. Think about it in this way. This, the physical discipline, coming to the Sabbath, not working for that 24 hours, dedicating that day to God. It's a physical discipline. That's that first step in that process in changing the way we think about time. Again, tithing, that physical discipline, say, and being disciplined, saying, I'm paying 10% first tithe, 10% second tithe, and there's the third tithe that we, we all pay. It's the first step. The physical discipline is the first step in changing the way that we think about, about money, right? Every, everything is God. It changes the way we think about wealth. It changes the way we think about, I use this term, personal resources, what we own, even though we know that that is all God's. We could say the same thing about many other laws, about laws about family relationships, about sex, right, about worship, which begin changing the way we think about our relationships with, with each other and with our Creator. In the, all these matters as, that we talked about so far, we, we start to begin with physical disciplines, which are meant then to teach us the spiritual side. The spiritual principles which are intended to transform, brethren, the way we think. Now, if we specifically talk about clean and unclean foods, God is very specific. And he provides us with the list of creatures that we can eat and those that we cannot eat. And he asks us to consciously make that, that distinction between what is clean and unclean. He sets before us, first of all, if we think along the same veins, this, the physical discipline meant then to teach us as we grow the spiritual principles. You know, if we only go so far as to learn the physical side, the physical discipline, without learning and, and applying the spiritual principle, then we've missed the mark. Let's look a bit into the spiritual principle Behind, be, behind making a distinction between clean and unclean meat. And over the years, people have tried to, and, and maybe successfully, but I'll say tried to validate the practice of avoiding unclean meat, citing uh, potential health dangers. I've read studies over the years, you might have too, you know, dangers related to pork or shellfish, whatever. And you read some of those reports and some of that statistics, and you know, it kind of makes sense. And I helped my father-in-law for years as I could in his meat processing plant. And my father-in-law was not in the church, but for many years before his wife and, my, and his daughters came into the church, he didn't eat pork because he butchered it, and he saw it. So he, he wasn't going to eat it anyway, right? But if we think about just avoiding it because there might be possible health, health dangers, that approach does not present us then with the spiritual principle that God wants to make a part of our thinking. You know, it's like saying adultery or fornication. The reason you want to avoid that is to, so you don't get a sexually transmitted disease. It, it, that's not the case, right? Having a no fornication or adultery policy does keep you safe from it catching STDs, but that's not the real reason for God's instruction. Think about it this way. What if modern science could take that crispy pork bacon and take all the bad stuff out of it, right? Or say, here, free love. If you do this, you'll be safe from STDs. Does that make them acceptable to God? We know the answer to that, right? But we have to consider that. What is acceptable to God? You know, it's, it's interesting to speculate, I think, why God tells us certain animals are clean or unclean based upon, you know, certain criteria. Cloven hooves, do they chew their cud? 
uh, do they have scales, you know, fins, etc. Et but in the end, we don't know for sure. God hasn't given us all the details or the reasons why certain combinations are okay and others are not. He, he simply doesn't tell us. The important thing to know is what for certain is that some things, in this case some foods, are acceptable to God and others are not. You see, our, our creator, the, the person who created everything, who chose you and I, he operates on a completely uh, different plane. We understand that. He has a different approach. He has different strategies. Let's, let's look at that just briefly. Isaiah chapter 55. It's a very common set of scriptures that we've that have been read a lot over the years. I think you'll recognize them as we get into them. But it talks about this, this fact that, that God is so much beyond what we are and is, operates on a different, as I mentioned, on a different plane. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Not even close. We can only imagine. Or maybe we even can't really imagine the difference. You can write down Jeremiah 10, 23. It says, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. As we talk about clean and unclean meats, it's very interesting to know another distinction I want to draw. The first mention of the concept of there being animals God considers clean as opposed to unclean. You don't have to turn there, but you can write it down. Genesis 6, verse 19, and also Genesis 7, verse 2. Actually, let's do turn there. Sorry. <laughs> As I think about it, Genesis 6, verse 19. And here he's talking to Noah. And consider the timing here. This is Noah. And of every living thing, Genesis 6, verse 19, and of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you, and they shall be male and female. Okay? Drop on down to chapter 7, verse 2. He says, You shall take with you seven of each of every clean animal, a male and his female, and two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. So just from these couple verses, we can see that God said to Noah to learn what the distinction between the clean and unclean animals was. That this distinction, I should say, was in place long before God entered into his covenant with Israel. We're talking about centuries before. In, in our Bibles, God doesn't provide Noah with a list of, of, of what's clean and unclean, but Noah, at this point we see, understood what God's instruction meant, and he was able to make it happen. Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 are where we can see those lists of animals. But that list of clean versus unclean animals was not spelled out, as far as we know, for our, for our sake, until 11, Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, again, which was recorded many centuries after this time of Noah that we're talking about. So those that would argue that the Old Covenant, that the termination of the Old Covenant meant the termination of the, the distinction between clean and unclean meat, don't have an argument. Again, the key takeaway I want you to remember here is that the concept of separating clean and unclean animals did not originate with the Old Covenant or the, some people call it the Mount Sinai Covenant. Turn over to Malachi, chapter 3. I think since it's important to the discussion of clean and unclean meat, let's take a moment to, 
to review what the termination of the Old Covenant meant for God's law. And this is important to our, to our conversation today, and it's important as ammunition for you to have if people start arguing about the Old Covenant is done away. Malachi 3 and is the one we'll look at first. Again, a very familiar scripture to most of us. It says for Malachi 3, verse 6, it says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. God does not change. It says, Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Hebrews 13 and verse 8 simply says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We understand that. I think all of us here do. You see, brethren, God bases his instruction to humanity on, on the spiritual principles that have always existed. He hasn't changed those. Right? It, Instructions regarding things like, like the priesthood or sacrifice, the temple, are still present in the New Covenant. The distinction to remember again, though, is that the administration and the, uh, the application, I should say, has changed. Now think about this, and we'll talk about it, but even the administration and the application of the Ten Commandments has changed under the New Covenant. Not the law, but the administration and the application. And let me explain that a bit. If we go back to the time of Israel, a significant part of God's old covenant instructions for Israel were about how to administer these uh, everlasting principles within the context of that, I don't want to say, that state, that, that nation border. And we understand that, right? To uh, administrate or administer in the courts of law. And we understand there were people tasked with maintaining the law and order. There were judges, there were, there were elders, there were kings. By contrast, the New Covenant Church, thankfully, <laughs> is not tasked with punishing people for violating God's commands. We don't have to take someone out and stone them for idolatry or adultery, thankfully. Right? There's no mandate from God to execute people for those things. We are not the ones to enforce restitution if, for injury or uh, administer justice, restitution, if you will, for theft. Under the new covenant, what we are tasked to do is teaching the people about these these life-giving truths that God puts before us. We are tasked to, to convince and persuade people and then encouraging them and then exhorting them to stick with it. See, the church of God has no police force to make people obey, nor should it. Again, in contrast, the administration of Israel had the power of life and death in their hands. We can see it time and again as we read through the Bible. Right? They were to teach and they were to enforce with the full power of the state. And again, we have to understand that this was only meant to be a passing phase until that time when Christ came and initiated the administration of the Spirit. Right? What I mean by that is when he starts writing those laws on people's hearts and on their minds, those people who, of course, are willing, are willing to follow God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's read verses 7 through 8. Second Corinthians chapter 3, let's read verses 7 and 8. It says, But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, 
which glory was passing away. Verse 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Again, brethren, the eternal principles of God have not changed. The administration of those laws has. Turn back a little bit to Romans 7, verse 14. Romans 7, verse 14. Actually, we'll read verses 13 and 14. Romans 7, starting in verse 13. It says, Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. And verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. You see, the scriptures, our Bible, contains laws, but we can't just look at it as a, as a book of law. Again, it's, it's so much more than that. It's a set of instructions on how God wants us to live so that we can develop the proper relationship with our Creator. Turn back a little bit further to John, John 17. John 17, let's read verses 2 and 3. We'll start in verse 1. John 17, verses 1 through 3, it says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. Verse 2, as you have given him authority over all flesh, so that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He wants us to learn, brethren, what, what is acceptable. He wants us to, to check how we think. He wants us to check how we do things. Revelation 14 and verse 12. Again here, it talks, we talk more about what to, God wants us to learn what is acceptable. Or again, how we think, what, how we do things. Revelation 14 verse 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. See, we as humans, we make this hard. Right? I get in my own way too often as I look back at my life. I mean, think about it. It's, God's given us what we need. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He just wants us to learn, to learn what is acceptable again and what we think, how we do things. We have to understand that, that God's way of doing things, it's far beyond time. It transcends time. It's far beyond the administration of the laws. It's deeper than that. Again, as we think about clean and unclean meat, specifically in the Old Covenant, you know, God, we know, gave Israel and us, we have it in our Bibles, a written list of the animals that are clean and unclean. We know that. We've read it many times. Now think about this. It could be the information was lost or forgotten since the days of Noah because how did Noah know what was clean and unclean? Did he have a list written down? Did he have it committed to memory? I don't know. But it also could be that due to the nature of the covenant with Israel that God simply wanted at that point to have everything in writing. Either way, we now have access to that information, right, in our Bible, in written form. But we also, and more importantly, we also then start to have the beginning 
of the explanation of the spiritual, I'm sorry, of the physical discipline behind, I should, let me say I had it right first. We also began to have an explanation of the spiritual principle behind this physical discipline of making the distinction between what is clean and unclean. And if I had to put it all just in a sentence, I would say that that simply is the pursuit of holiness. Let's turn back to Leviticus 11. We'll look at this a little bit more. Leviticus chapter 11. We know that this chapter talks about clean and unclean, and it talks about the foods that we can eat and which those we may not. What happens, you know, what happened in ancient Israel if, if a person would eat these things? But I want to draw us our attention to, to verse 45. Well, let's look at 44. Starting in 44, it says, For I am the Lord your God. After this list of everything he said to eat or not eat, I am the Lord your God, and you shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth, for I am the Lord who brings you up and out of the land of Egypt to be your God. And what did I mention? That, that explanation of the spiritual principle or where we want to be he says it right here. You therefore be holy. Because I am holy. Deuteronomy 14, verse 2. Again, the other chapter I mentioned where it talks about the, the clean and unclean foods. In this case, before it starts listing these things in verse 3, I want to point out verse 2. Because God, we need to be set apart for God's special purpose. Deuteronomy 14, verse 2. He says, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you <coughs> excuse me, to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And what does verse 3 do? It starts in on that list again. You shall not eat any detestable thing, and then it gives us that description. If we simply consider the Old Covenant instructions, they, they have a lot to say about cleanness versus uncleanness. Think about when Israel was in, in just in the desert, in the wilderness for all those years. God was present within the camp. Right? He was present in the nation. He was present in the tabernacle. He was present in the temple. And so cleanliness and holiness at that point was demanded. God was physically there. The good news for us is that the, the spiritual principles behind these regulations are alive and well today within the new covenant. And I think we, we understand that. Think about this. For example, the laws of the temple cleanliness now apply to you and I specifically because we are referred to in more than one place as our bodies as the temple of God. These are applicable to the individual who is called and chosen of God because he is present within us through the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. There are a few scriptures that speak to it. We'll just look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we'll read verses 15 through 20. First Corinthians 6, we'll start in verse 15. He says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot... It, is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. Verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord, he who is following God's commandments, not just for the physical reasons, but for the spiritual implications, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Verse 18, flee sexual immorality. 
Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know, it says, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Let that sink in. Verse 20, for you, talking about you and I, individually, specifically to you, for you were bought at a price, and therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We talk about that around the Passover time. We understand we have been purchased by him through Christ's blood. He wants to dwell within us. He doesn't want us to contaminate ourselves with any, any kind of spiritual defilement or, or uncleanness and bring that into his presence. You know, if you think about it, the, we think about the physical side of, of clean and unclean meats. The physical discipline of avoiding unclean meat is pretty easy. I mean, you've got to read some labels. They change things on you, but it's that part's pretty easy. It's kind of a, I don't know, a beginner's step, right? It's simple, it's straightforward with a specific list of do's and don'ts. Can I have this? Uh, nope. Verse 4 says no. Yeah, that's, that's easy. But we can't let that become our righteousness. You see, God wants our obedience to unclean meat to lead to something more. He wants it to lead... I should say, God wants holiness in our thoughts. He wants it in our actions. He wants it in, in everything that we do so that we might dwell with him. Right? That we might dwell with each other. <laughs> we, that we might dwell with ourselves in peace. Let's look at Mark chapter 7. It's another aspect that I want to touch on because... We talk about this spiritual uncleanness. Mark 7, as we look at this story, verses 1 through 8, we're going to see that this is a, uh, there's much more to this subject than just eating a clean or unclean meat. Jesus, again, teaches on spiritual uncleanness. Mark 7, let's start in verse 1. It says, And the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. And now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. Verse 4, when they came from the marketplace, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. And then verse 5, the Pharisees and scribes asked Christ, he says, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And then I like his answer. He answered them and said, Well did I say a prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Again, these were practices. These were traditions. This was nothing to do with God's law. Verse 8, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other things you do. Now, Note, this, this isn't a discussion about unclean meats. It's a discussion at this point about traditions, right? Specifically, Jewish traditions and performing a ceremony uh, of washing their hands so they could consider themselves clean and holy. We read and we understand it was a tradition of the elders, and the Pharisees took that and tried to apply instructions for the Levitical priest to themselves and everyone then to build up the idea in reality of a priesthood of, of all believers. But we also can see they were also using it as a measuring stick in determining who was righteous and who was not. 
you can look at that a little bit if you want over in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 and Deuteronomy 40 verse 13 there's some other examples right, we understand if we look into this that they would when they're out in the marketplace they would come back and they would where they might have had some contact with unclean people such as non-Jews you know, or tradesmen or people themselves who might have, have touched an unclean thing and then transmitted that uncleanness to others, kind of, kind of that sort of thing. So they, they didn't want to be a part of, they didn't want, I should say, this, this sort of contamination entering into them through food, which they were going to pick up and eat with their hands. But again, we see Jesus pointed out that that's not God's law. Those are human rules. Those are traditions. And I like as we look at going on in verse 14 again. After, so after showing them what a bunch of hypocrites they were, he offers up a very clear explanation of what uncleanness means, truly means, on a spiritual level. Verse 14, we'll pick up the story, Mark 7. It says, when he had called all the multitudes to himself, he said, hear me, everyone, and understand. Verse 15, and we'll talk about verse 15 maybe a little bit more in a minute, but let's read it. There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 17, when he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And so he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that what enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Verse 19, because it does not enter his heart but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For, what, from, for from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Again, this is the spiritual principle between discerning what is clean and unclean. Now, I mentioned verse 15, but it's verse 19. It, verse 19 is often used, and I've heard it, I've had people bring it up to me as an argument, right, to, to say Jesus is using this teachable moment to declare all for, formerly unclean meats now clean. We know that's not true, but let me take a minute to explain. There's really two points under this. First, their argument is based on a dispute. I'm going to read this to you is based on a dispute about the verb tense in the original Greek manuscripts. The traditional translation has been, quote, thus making all foods purified, unquote. Right, that all foods eaten, that all food eaten is purified by the project, process of digestion and then the excretion of that. That's, again, what's found in the majority of Greek texts. But it goes on to say, the modern translations say, quote, thus he declared all foods clean, meaning it was Jesus who proclaimed all foods clean. Okay, going on though, they had second point. It says, we don't need to be a textual scholar to notice that the conversation was not about what meats were clean or unclean. Right? The conversation was about hand washing to avoid contaminating foods. You know, to, to, to the, well, I will read what it says. Um, to say then, all unclean meats are now clean, Jesus would have been making a conclusion or a statement that does not logically flow from what was previously said about hand washing and defilement. Notice that the very next thing Jesus is recorded as doing, let's read that in verse 24 through 30. <clears throat> verse 24, and he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. And then he put his hands on his eyes again and made them look up, and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. And then he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell anyone in the town. And now Jesus and his disciples went out to the town of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked the disciples, saying, What do men say that I am? 
And so they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Right? Jesus, in so many places in our Bible, and we won't have the time to go through them, but he teaches that evil thoughts and evil actions are what makes a person unclean. Now, he, again, he corrected the Pharisees here for making an external show, right, in public of separating clean and unclean while, while letting greed and evil within themselves, you know, come out. Brethren, the Pharisees, hand-washing rules were something God never required. But making a distinction, a very clear distinction between clean meats and unclean meats is a requirement that God has set before his people. And we talked about it already, but we have to remember that it was there before the covenant with Israel. Right? God recorded it in the covenant of Israel. And we have to understand that it's going to be the same. It will be that way forever. We also have to remember, as people try to make the arguments and add things, God tells us very specifically, do not take away from my word and do not add to it. We read what God tells us here. We do what God tells us. Let's look at a couple more scriptures as I start to wrap up here. But Revelation 18 Verse 2. And so just coming back from the Feast of Tabernacles, the last, the, the eighth day, you know, understanding all of that, we're looking at a time here in Revelation where God sends Jesus to judge the nations he, that he still considers certain animals unclean. As I mentioned, it, it's not going to change. Verse 2 of Revelation 18, and he said, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And again, we know the time that this depicts. And it has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul soul, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. It's not going to change. Isaiah 66. These would be the last set of scriptures that we turn to. Isaiah chapter 66. I want to read verses 15 through 17. We do have, most of you have read it probably several times, a nice book on clean and unclean foods. And a lot of this information that I've talked about is, is directly out of there. If you have questions, I would read, the, read that entire book. But Isaiah 66, verses 15 through 17, it says, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots. Again, we're talking about a future time. Like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with the flames of fire. For by fire and his sword the Lord will judge all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Verse 17, those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, says the Lord. He will judge people that way. Brethren, God has always, always considered certain animal flesh to be unclean and not acceptable for food. And it's true. God's laws are very specific. He tells us what we can eat and can't eat. But it's a physical discipline, brethren. We have to remember it's a physical discipline to remind us always of the spiritual discipline that we must also practice. Right? Don't let unclean, mean, unclean meat enter your body. Take that to the spiritual side. Do not let unclean thoughts, unclean attitudes, unclean actions enter your mind. Remember the instruction, very clear instruction that God has given us. He says, be holy, for I am holy. 